You have fallen from grace. Now, of course, we understand in these verses, there's two and three, where it talks about men becoming circumcised. They're not talking about circumcision just for the fact of medical uh, reasons. They're talking about being circumcised because the old law required that every male needed to be circumcised. So what it is, this is a religious ritual that they're talking about. Any kind of religious ritual that we get into that goes back to the old law will take us away from Christ. The old law dealt with Moses and the prophets and the forerunners up to Christ. But once Christ came, we no longer needed the old law to live, to live by. Now, it was important for us, and it still is today, for us to help us understand the new law. You know, I love going through the Old Testament and making references. Uh, when the New Testament makes reference, go back and read that section and, and understand what's really going on there. It helps us that way, but we don't need to live by it. And that's what Paul is saying here. If you are going to go ahead and go back into the old law and take a little bit of it, well, guess what? You're required to take it all. You can't just have a little bit of the old law. If you're going to go back for a little bit, you've got to take everything. So everyone who goes back and, and tries to live by the old law, they're going to have to go back and sacrifice animals and doves and pigeons and, and goats and sheep and all this other. They're going, to have, they're going to have to have it all. But you know what? They can't. It's impossible because the temple does not exist anymore. So animal sacrifice can't be... So there's no way that we can go back and take you all of the old law. But you're going to become indebted to it. So since you can't sacrifice animals and go back to the old, uh, back to Jerusalem, go all the way back to the old law, you can't do that. So there's no way you can fulfill it. Man couldn't fulfill it at the beginning when the old law was in force. That was the problem. God's law, the Mosaic law, was perfect. But man could not keep it perfectly. So it was only there for a period of time. It was only there to bring us to Christ. Now that we have Christ, he's saying, don't, don't go away from Christ. Don't, don't go back to the law. In verse 4 he says, if you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. You know, Paul writes so much that Moses brought law, but Christ brought grace. So if we are going to go back to the law, then we must exit away from grace. We must be estranged from our, our groom, if you will. The church, of course, we know is the bride of Christ. So if we are estranged from Christ, we are estranged as a bride away from her groom. And we are incomplete. We cannot be complete in the old law. Not any longer. It's done. It's a, so there's an exhortation here. To stand fast, it keeps us from becoming estranged from Christ. If we stand firm, we will remain faithful to God. When we start to waver away, we start to walk away from, from Christ, we walk away from God, we are, going to be, we are becoming unfaithful to God. You can't have it both ways. You can't put one hand in the world and have one hand with God. It's got to be all or nothing. In Philippians, in chapter 3, starting at verse 17, I just want to read a little section here. It goes on down to chapter 4, verse 1. There's only about six verses here, I believe. But listen to what Paul says here to the church of Philippi. He says, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have for us a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now I tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, which from which we also eagerly wait for the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able to subdue all things to Himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. We must, because, because, of what Paul just wrote here in these last verses of chapter 3. Because there are those out there who do not walk according to the ways of Christ. We can't follow them. We must follow that example that Paul has left us. We must follow the example that he followed, which is Christ. You know, I read something just a few days ago on, the, on Facebook. It says, do not follow Christians, but follow the Christ. And that's true. Because Christians can fall. Christians will fall at times. We're not perfect. 
If we follow Christ, then we will stay on the right track. And Paul has said that. Follow him as he follows Christ. Paul is saying, if I go, if I go astray, if I go and walk off from Christ, then don't follow me. We don't have the right to follow people. We are to follow God. Therefore, and listen to the words that he uses here in chapter 4, verse 1. It says, My beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown. He saw these people as so precious people. They were wonderful people. If you read the book of Philippians, you understand they were a faithful group of people. They were people who loved, who loved at the deepest emotion they could get, the deepest part of their hearts, the love came out. And it was the love of God. And that's what he's talking about. These people love so much, he saw them as such a precious people. And we need, to, we need to, to study this book and realize what Paul is talking about. These were truly beloved and longed for Christians. They were trying the best of their ability to follow him. There's an exhortation there for us to continue to be steadfast. Secondly, flip over to the book of Daniel, if you will. Daniel chapter 3. Let's look at one example here of steadfastness. Daniel chapter 3. We're going to start reading here in just a couple of moments at verse 13. <clears throat> but I want to set it up for you a little bit before we read that. Nebuchadnezzar is the king here. And he has this, this huge uh, monument, if you will, this huge statue, this idol made out of gold, and he sets it up there in the town square, and he says, whenever the, the music plays, whenever the harps play, and the lutes play, and the flutes play, and all the music plays, everyone has to bow down to this, this statue. And of course, everyone's doing it, they all, the music plays, and all these people bow down, but then some of his people come and say, listen, there's a couple of Jews here, actually three Jews, that they didn't do it. They didn't bow down. So he calls Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to him. And he says, now, tell me, did you, did you not bow down? Why did you not do this? He was confused because here were the people that he had, he had treated very kindly. He thought, well, they owe me this. But look at verse 13 and, and following here to verse 18. He says, then Shadrach, or excuse me, then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you did not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Nebuchadnezzar did not think that God could deliver these three men from his hand. We read on. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, you have no need, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image that you have set up. Now think about that. We talk about being faithful to God. We talk about being steadfast to God. In our world today, I don't know that any of us here have ever been threatened to be thrown into a furnace to be burned alive. Well, that's what was going to happen here. Faced with being roasted, really, a lot. Like a lot of the early martyrs were back in, in uh, the biblical times and even three or four hundred years ago. You look at William Tyndall, first person to translate the Bible into English. He was burned on the stake, alive. People had to face that. We today, thank God, we don't have to face those kind of situations. But what if you did? What if you did? What if somebody came up to you and said, you know what, you're going to have to deny Jesus Christ or we're going to kill you by burning you alive at the stake? What would you do? These are important questions to think about. Are we really committed to God? Are we really going to stand fast on what we know to be the truth? These three men were faithful and they did not give up on God and they would not walk away from God. 
You know, and they, you can say, well, you know, they were saved from it. And that's true, but what did they say here? It says, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us, but look at verse 18, but if not, even if he doesn't, we're not going to serve your gods, and we're not going to worship your golden image. We will go to the furnace, and we'll die, but we're not going to turn away from God. They had the attitude, and that's what we're talking about tonight, is the attitude of steadfastness. It wasn't the fact that they were, they survived. And we know, we go on, we read it, we, we see as they, as they were getting ready to throw them in, Nebuchadnezzar was so mad, he said, he said, get the fire going seven times as hot as it is right now. And he said, the men who threw them into the fire, they were burned up outside of the, of the furnace because it was so hot. But when Nebuchadnezzar went to look in, he didn't see three, but he saw four walking along in the flames. And when they came out, they did not even have the smell of smoke on their clothing. There was no nothing burnt on them. Of course, we understand who that fourth person was. It was the second person of the Godhead, who we know is Jesus Christ. The representation of God on this earth. He was in there and he protected those three men because of what they did. But again, the attitude that they had was not that I know that God is going to spare us. They had no idea. They said, whether he spares us or not, we're not going to worship your gods. We're going to stay faithful to our God. So that was the attitude that they had, and that's the attitude we've got to have today. We always pray that God protects us from our enemies. Someday he may not. Are you still going to stand firm and be faithful to him, even when he doesn't? If you would flip over to James, James chapter 5, we'll look at our our third point tonight. In James chapter 5. Our third point is enduring hardship. <laughs> Being steadfast for God he explains to us that we're going to have hardships. If we stand firm for anything, you're going to have a hardship. Someone's not going to agree with you, so they're going to argue with you about it. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be politics, it could be religion, it could be anything. Favorite TV show. If you stand firm enough, somebody's going to have an opposing opinion and they're going to argue with you about it. But here, enduring hardship because we're standing firm for God. In James chapter 5, starting at verse 7, it says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example for suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end in, intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. We have a promise from God. If we stand firm, if we are steadfast, then our end will be wonderful. We won't have to endure suffering for all eternity. Really, when you think about it, all will suffer on this earth. Everybody's going to suffer. But the important issue is, how do you take it? Do you take it patiently? Do you take it knowing that it's not going to last forever? It's not going to be an eternal problem? That someday the suffering is going to end. You know, the prophets knew that someday they had faith that someday their suffering would end, so they took it patiently and waited on God. They didn't know how long it was going to be. Could have been 10 years, 20 years, could have been 30 years. They didn't know. But the one thing they didn't know was that God is faithful. We have to believe that today ourselves, that God is faithful and His promises are going to be true. That we're not going to suffer forever. But He is going to bring our suffering to an end someday. And then we will have a wonderful eternity with Him in heaven. In conclusion, I want to quote a little section of Psalm 57. It's verse 7. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. And that's really what it should be all about. A heart that is steadfast is one that is happy and that rejoices. It is not tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, as Ephesians 4.14 tells us. 
It is a heart that is steady. It is a heart that knows who he believes in. It is a heart that will never give up. I said, we understand as Christians, we're going to suffer, we're going to fall. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to sin at times. But our steadfast heart is one that will not continue and go back into the world of sin. <laughs> Even though it does sin at times, it will come back to God. And it will rejoice. That heart will rejoice because God allows it to come back. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 tells us that God is faithful and He will forgive us as long as we repent and we ask God for forgiveness. We need to praise God and thank God every day for what we have. You know, I, I said it at different times that we think about the blessings that we have of God and we turn our life, but we've got to think about the blessings that we have right now, every day. You know, again, Jesus stated in the Sermon on the Mount that God brings the rain and the sunshine on the good and the, and the bad, on the just and the unjust. Everyone gets those kind of blessings. But there are blessings that Christians have right now, knowing that we have a home in heaven, knowing that we have the words of life in our hands and in our hearts, that we have an opportunity to reach out to other people and to help them to know about God and help them to be steadfast. You know, one of the greatest things we can do in this life is to help somebody else get to heaven. And that's what it's all about. Teach people and encourage people to be strong. If you're here tonight, you need the prayers of this congregation. We'll be happy to pray with you. We want to encourage you to help you to be steadfast. Have the attitude of steadfast. If you're here tonight, you're not a Christian. If you wish to put on Christ and have your sins washed away, it would be a privilege and a pleasure for us to help you tonight if you come now. I have decided to follow Jesus. I